We have now come to the very last study of our series, a study that is to not only consider our past experience, our present, but also how our decisions today will determine our inter eternal destiny. I would like to begin by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. This particular verses bring to view a person who is building in preparation for a fire. The fire that we are talking about is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. What do you think about trials? Many of us do not like trials. I don't know anyone that really says, Wow, here comes another trial but maybe we ought to be that way. In Life Sketches, page 265 to 266, Life Sketches, page 265 to 266, the servant of the Lord writes, to be tried and tested is a part of our moral discipline. So we need moral discipline, and to be tried and tested is a part of that moral discipline. In volume 1, page 309 to 310, Volume 1, page 39 through 310 says, We are too quickly discouraged and earnestly cry for the trial to be removed from us when we should plead for patience to endure and grace to overcome. When we pray, Lord, please remove the trial from me. When we come to prayer meeting and say, Lord, please remove the trial from me, it is a prayer request that should not be answered. It says we are too quickly discouraged and earnestly cry for the trial to be removed when we should plead for what? For patience to endure and grace to overcome. So in reality, we need to be praying not for our trial to be removed, but rather that we may have grace to be able to be victorious over it and also that we may have the ability to endure those trials. Now, if we do not endure the trial, you know what we're telling God? 
If we fail on one, what does it mean? In Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 10, Isaiah 48, 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Christ chooses us while we are in the furnace of affliction. Because it is in the furnace that character is really manifested. Now what happens if we fail the test the first time? In Volume 4, Bible Commentary, page 1146, Volume 4, Bible Commentary, page 1146. It says, God's children are always being tested in the furnace of affliction. If they endure the first trial, it is not necessary for them to pass through a similar ordeal the second time. But if they fail, the trial is brought to them again and again, each time being still more trying and severe. So each of us have different tests, whether the trial is due to conflicts, various conflicts, or whether it's even in regards to our decisions that we have to make. When we fail on one, God wants to save us. And because our God wants to save us, He brings it full circle again, and we come back to that trial once again. But the second time, it is more trying and more severe. Thus opportunity after opportunity is placed before them of gaining the victory and proving themselves true to God. But if they continue to manifest rebellion, God is compelled at last to remove His Spirit and light from them. Well, God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to have victory. And so this is why we should pray for patience to endure and grace to overcome. Now in this particular building, there are six different types of material. If you notice, there is the gold, silver, and precious stones, and there is the wood, hay, and stubble. Now, each of these materials must endure the fire. They must go through the fire. Now, what happens with gold when it goes through the fire? When you put gold in the fire, it simply melts under the heat. And at the end of it all, what happened to the gold? It is purified. So when fire comes in contact with gold, it simply purifies the gold. What about silver? The same thing happens with silver as with gold. Now with precious stones, what happens with a precious stone? Well, precious stone comes in contact with the fire, nothing happens to it. It goes through the fire, you polish it up a little bit more and that's it. It gets a little bit of... Uh, black on it and that's it. Now what about wood, hay and stubble? Each of them are burned. But something is interesting about each of those characteristics. Those characteristics such as wood, hay and stubble, do they burn the same length of time? No, they all burn up, but some burn longer. The wood burns a lot longer than the hay and the hay burns a little bit longer than the stubble. Stubble just goes puff up and it's gone. Now what about the gold, silver, and precious stones. Well, these do not have the burning up qualities because they all are very similar. They both endure the whole fire. But there is a difference in value. For example, gold. Would you rather have a pound of gold in your pocket or would you have a pound of silver in your pocket? Obviously, a pound of gold is much more valuable than silver. And so, does this mean that in the kingdom of God we are going to have a different value system? When we all get to heaven, are we all going to be equal? Or is there going to be those that are more valuable than others? Or maybe I should say, maybe there may be those who have a more valuable experience than others. And what about those that are burned up? Or is there different lengths of time of burning? Let us examine some of these questions. This foundation that is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3.11 could be one of two buildings. We have, of course, the church that is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 2 also. They both mention that each of us are being built in, as stones in the church of God. 
but it also can talk about our personal character. And I would like us to talk a little bit about this in a more personal way. I don't want to just go to something, oh, to the church, somewhere a little bit further, because we are the church. And I want us to talk a little bit about our own personal experience. How many times I have heard this, oh, I'd be happy to be in heaven even if I just barely make it there. I would like to just barely squeeze through the door. I don't need anything great. I just want to barely make it in there. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 15 1 Corinthians 3, 15 says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Are there going to be people there that barely make it in the kingdom of God? Well, according to this verse, it sure seems that way, because some will lose everything else, but they will make it there by fire. Today, as we consider the building of our eternal character, the plan for eternal, of the eternal kingdom, I want us to think a little bit about the cost, the cost of going to that kingdom. And specifically, I want to talk about the cost of neglecting or voluntarily neglecting our preparation. In Luke chapter 14, verses 27 through 30, Luke chapter 14, verses 27 through 30, says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. When you begin a project, what's the first thing that you have to do? The first thing is you have to count the cost. How much is this project going to cost? Specifically, here's talking about a building. When we have to build a house or something, the first thing you do is not just decide on a plan, but, well, you do decide on a plan, but you have to decide how much is it going to cost and how much are you prepared to spend on it. Well, about this eternal building, this building that we're talking about here, that's going to last throughout all eternal ages, how much are you willing to spend in this building? Let's take a look. In heaven, is everyone going to be on the same level of enjoying things to the same extent throughout all eternity? Let us find out some very important statements in regard to our own experience. I found some very interesting passages in Volume 9 Manuscript Releases and also in the book This Day with God. As I read those statements in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it seems clear to me that in the eternal kingdom some will be gold, some will be silver, some will be precious stones. And there's three categories that do not make it at all. What about our eternal kingdom? Let us take a look. Volume 9, Manuscript Releases, page 21. Eternity is before us. All improvements we make here of our mental powers, all the high attainments we make, in refining and elevating ourselves by connecting closely with heaven will be translated with us. What? This will be translated with us. So, if we improve our mental powers here, the high attainments that we arrive at, in refining and elevating ourselves by connecting closely with heaven, they will be translated with us. Well, if we dwarf our capabilities by inaction, if we deteriorate our talents, which are susceptible to the highest cultivation, we cannot, in the better world, redeem that past neglect of self-culture, that great loss. What does it say here? It says, in the better world, we cannot redeem that past neglect. 
maybe somehow in eternity we can make up for it? This day with God, page 350, let us see. This day with God, page 350. Every sin, every unrighteous action, every transgression of the law of God tells with a thousandfold more force upon the actor than the sufferer. You know, there are things that we do to other people. Do you realize that what we do to somebody else actually has a thousand more fold effect upon us than it does upon them? That's what it says here. Every time one of the glorious faculties with which God has enriched man is abused or misused, that faculty loses forever a portion of its vigor and will never be as it was before the abuse it suffered. Every abuse inflicted upon our moral nature in this life is felt not only for time but for eternity. Though God may forgive the sinner, yet eternity will not make up that voluntary loss sustained in this life. Eternity itself will not make up for those voluntary losses that we had here in this world. This is why it's so important for us as we study this series, as we study the lessons from the Word of God, that we make decisions today not to lose any more moments, not to lose any more time in preparation for eternity. What about 1 Corinthians 3.13? Oh, if I can just make it through the door. It says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Well, so long as I make it there, I don't care. Well, let's take a look. Again, Volume 9, Manuscript Releases, page 21. Some may be saved as by fire. Their useless life has brought them infinite loss. We should make improvements in this life, all that we can by the help and grace of God, knowing we can take these improvements with us into heaven. That's right. We can take those improvements with us into heaven. Notice this now. We will glorify our Father in heaven in proportion as we purify and perfect our characters here. So when we get up to heaven, we want to glorify God, don't we? Well, to what degree are we going to glorify God? To the degree that we have purified and perfected our characters here in this earth. This day with God 350. To go forth to the next, the future life, deprived of half the power which might be carried there is a terrible thought. I remember one time I was mowing in the back over here, this back piece up here in this hill, and I was mowing with my tractor. I had just had the engine rebuilt, and I'm mowing up there, up and down the hill, and I realized somehow I hardly had any power. I was going up and down, and the engine began to sound strange and I thought, boy, I hope I can finish this job before it gets all messed up. I didn't know what was going on. I had hardly any power. And then I looked over to the side and I realized that one of the wires that were going to the spark plug was pulled off. Somehow when I went around one of the branches, it had lifted underneath there and pulled off one spark plug. So I was running on three cylinders. That was really poor running. Now, how many cylinders do you want to run in heaven? Do you want to have the full power that God has given there? Or do you want to go there with only the half the power? Do you want to go in heaven throughout all eternity only in half force or a quarter force? Is that possible? Here's what it says. To go forth into the next, the future life, deprived of half the power which might be carried there is a terrible thought. The days of probation lost here in acquiring a fitness for heaven is a loss which will never be recovered. When will we recover it? Never. 
the capacity. Now, how much do you want to enjoy heaven? You like it just a little bit or do you like to really thoroughly enjoy heaven, which is your choice? How much do you really want to enjoy that eternal life? Well, here's what it goes on. The capacity of enjoyment will be less in the future life for the misdemeanors and abuse of moral powers in this life. So if we are abusing our moral powers right here, what's going to happen? We're going to go up to heaven and our capacity for enjoyment will actually be smaller. Yes, we will enjoy heaven. Don't misunderstand me here in this presentation. We will enjoy it, but our capacity for enjoyment will only be small. We will not be able to enjoy it as thoroughly as we could because of our actions here. Yes, what we do in this world will determine our eternal destiny. The capacities of enjoyment will be less in the future life for the misdemeanors and abuse of moral powers in this life. However high we might attain in the future life, we might soar higher and still higher if we had made the most of our God-given privileges and golden opportunities to improve our faculties here in this probationary existence. You know, we could actually go higher and higher. How high do you want to go when the earth made new? The things that we've been studying about here, it is time that we implement these things in our life and to go deeper in the knowledge of Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. The time is now not to play around with sorcery. Oh no, now is time to burn those magical books and go on into the eternal world. Volume 9, Manuscript Releases, page 21. What is the greatest possible good that we can do to our fellow man? What's the best thing that we can do for our neighbors, for our friends, and for our associates? What is the best that we can do for them? Volume 9, Manuscript Releases, page 21 again. The greatest possible good we can do to our fellow men is to overcome our own faults and improve our characters, making them as excellent and symmetrical as possible. This is the best that we can do for our people around us. Then our influence upon our fellow men will be more effectual than even the pulpit labor of the most learned ministers without their seeking to improve the character and purify the life. Imagine if those ministers also improve their character and purify their life, how much more powerful that will be. Let your light so shine before men that they, in seeing your good works, may glorify our Father in heaven. Now you may think to yourself, well, I already blew it, so why even try? No, no, no. You see, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16 has a very important point there. It says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So we have an opportunity to redeem the time. Now how do we redeem the time? Can you make up for yesterday? No. There's nothing you can ever do for yesterday. What you did yesterday was done. It's finished. It will never again be replaced. Yesterday is gone forever. So what should I do? How can I redeem my past neglect? Christ Object Lessons, page 342. Christ Object Lessons, page 342. We are admonished to redeem the time, but time squandered can never be recovered. Oh, we just said that. It can never be recovered. We cannot call back even one moment. How many times you look back and say, Oh, if I had that moment to do again, if I had that hour to replace, if I can just change it one more time, I'd love to do that. But you cannot. It's gone, forever gone. The only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of that which remains, by being co-workers with God in His great plan of redemption. The only thing that we can do is make the most of that time that is remaining. And how do we make the most of that time that is remaining? What do we do? Acts of the Apostles, page 599. Acts of the Apostles, page 599. After quoting 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 14 and 15, it says, The Christian who faithfully presents the word of life, leading men and women into the way of holiness and peace, 
is bringing to the foundation material that will endure. And in the kingdom of God, he will be honored as a wise builder. What is he to do? The Christian who is faithfully giving the word of life. And how do we faithfully give the word of life? First of all, by experiencing it ourselves. Remember what we read there a moment ago. The greatest possible good we can do to our fellow man is to overcome our own faults and improve our characters, making them as excellent and symmetrical as possible. So this is the very first thing that we need to do. We need to improve our own character. We need to improve our own life. And once we improve our own life, then we are to faithfully present the word of life leading men and women into the way of holiness and peace. This type of person is bringing to the foundation material that will endure. And in the kingdom of God, he will be honored as a wise builder. In Review and Herald, March 1st, 1887. Review and Herald, March 1, 1887. And if those who are so highly favored with entrusted truths failed through love for earthly things to perform the part assigned them, it would have been better for them had they never been born. If we look at every one of us have been given a specific thing to do in this world, God has given every single one of us responsibilities. If we fail to do the part performed that God has given to us to do, it would have been better if we had never been born. Now some of you may think, well, I don't have all these talents to do all these things. Well, you know, one person was given five, another two, and another one. And you know, God is going to expect from the five, not four, not three. He's going to expect from him five. From the one that has two, he's going to expect only two. And from the one, he'll expect only one. But if you do not improve what you do have, you will lose it. If those who are so highly favored with entrusted truths fail through love for earthly things to perform the part assigned them, it would have been better for them had they never been born. Not only will they lose heaven themselves, but failing to act their part in the great plan of saving their fellow man, they will scatter from Christ by thus neglecting to do their appointed work. Others will follow their example and there they will be cursed of God. There are many souls of all nations and tongues and people to be enlightened. Are the chosen royal people of God paralyzed that they cannot see from the word of God their duty and sense the weighty responsibility that rests upon them to be laborers together with God? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me were the words that fell from the lips of the divine teacher. Now, one of the very first steps in this direction, one of the very first things that we are to do in order to work for souls is found in the book Education, page 268 and 269. Education, 268 and 269. It says, Another obligation too often lightly regarded, one that to the youth awakened to the claims of Christ needs to be made plain, is the obligation of church relationship. That's right. One of the very first things is we need to understand the obligation that we have of church relationship. Very close and sacred is the relation between Christ and His church. He the bridegroom and the church the bride. He the head and the church the body. Connection with Christ then involves connection with His church. What does it say here? Connection with Christ then involves connection with His church. The church is organized for service. What's the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of it being organized? The purpose of God's church being organized is that it is organized for service. And in a life of service to Christ, connection with the church is one of the first steps. If we want to serve Christ, if we want to make up for that lost time, if we want to redeem the time, one of the first steps is connection with His church. It says connection with the church is one of the very first steps. Loyalty to Christ demands the faithful performance of church duties. So for us to show our loyalty to Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, it will be in faithfully performing the church duties that have been given us. This is an important part of one's training. And in a church imbued with a master's life, it will lead directly to effort for the world without. You see, all of us are under a couple of choices. 
This day with God, page 350. This day with God, page 350. We are all under one or the other of two great captains. One, the creator of man and of the world, is the greatest of all. All owe him the allegiance of their whole being, the devotion of their entire affection. We owe it to God. We owe it to him. If the mind is given to his control, and if God has the molding and developing of the powers of the mind, new moral power will be received daily from the source of all wisdom and all strength. Moral blessings and divine beauties will reward the efforts of everyone whose mind is heaven-bent. We may grasp revelations, heavenly beauties that lie beyond the short vision of the worldling, that outshine the imagination of the great mind and the most learned philosopher who has not connected himself with the infinite power. Yes, to be connected in the work of God is the most wonderful thing that it could ever be to a human being. To be part of His church, to be working in His church involves more talents, more abilities, and more joy than anything else that can ever be given you know when I work with people and I find a soul that has given their heart to Jesus Christ and I was able to be there to help them in some way that is more rewarding than anything else that this world can give that joy is truly satisfying this is why God wants you to enter into his joy in the eternal world will be able to see that joy forever and ever and ever this is why now is our time to make those type of decisions. Volume 5, page 200. The volume 5, page 200. We waste a lot of time fearful of the future. How many times I hear people telling me today, Oh, we got to be very careful. There is danger coming up. There's all these dangers. The Sunday law is coming. The oppression is coming. Persecution is coming. We better run and hide. I'm sorry, now is not the time to run and hide. It says here, the habit of brooding over anticipated evils is unwise and unchristian. That's right. Worried about the future, fearful of all these things is actually unchristian. That's what it says. The habit of brooding over anticipated evils is unwise and unchristian. In thus doing, we fail to enjoy the blessings and to improve the opportunities of the present. What about right now? People tell me, what are you going to do when all that time comes? Well, what am I going to do right now when I see souls in need? I'm going to go there instead of running and hiding in the mountains. Yeah, Satan would love us to go up there and hide right now because then we will not be giving the message to the world. Oh, no, brethren. Now is the time. What did it say here? The habit of brooding over anticipated evils is unwise and unchristian. In thus doing, we fail to enjoy the blessings and to improve the opportunities of the present. The Lord requires us to perform the duties of today and to endure its trials. We are today to watch that we offend not in word or deed. We must today praise and honor God. By the exercise of living faith today, we are to conquer the enemy. We must today seek God and be determined that we will not rest satisfied without His presence. We should watch and work and pray as though this were the last day that would be granted us. What should we be doing if today was your last day? If you would not see another sunrise, if today would be the end of your life, would you do something different? Well, it says right here, we should watch and work and pray as though this were the last day that would be granted us. How intensely earnest then would be our life. How closely would we follow Jesus in all our words and deeds. You see, we must be willing to be tried and to be searched by the Lord. We must be willing to have God to prepare us for, me for eternity. We need to be able to rejoice in the things that happen to us. You know, when Paul and Silas was thrown down in that jail cell, what did they do? Did they moan and groan and say, wow, we're being persecuted? No, they praised the Lord in that situation. And what about you and me? Shall we not take time to praise the Lord? Volume 4, page 85 to 86. True grace is willing to be tried. What is true grace doing? True grace is willing to be tried. If we are loath to be searched by the Lord, our condition is serious indeed. 
We should be willing to be tested. We should be eager for the test that God has given to us. God is the refiner and the purifier of souls. In the heat of the furnace, the dross is separated forever from the true silver and gold of the Christian character. Jesus watches the test. He knows what is needed to purify the precious metal that it may reflect the radiance of His divine love. I'm reminded here of the statement there in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. It says, but verse 2 and on, But who, shall, who may abide the day of His coming? And who shall stand when He appeareth? For He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. What does He want to do? He wants to purify them so they can offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. You see, now is our time to do this remedial work. Volume 9, Manuscript Releases, page 21 to 22 again. Oh, that the people of God would take this to heart, that they would consider that not one wrong will be righted after Jesus comes. Not one error of character will be removed when Christ shall come. Now is our time of preparation. Now is our time of washing our robes of character in the blood of the Lamb. If we go on excusing our errors and trying to make ourselves believe we're about right, we deceive our own souls and we'll find ourselves weighed in the balances and found wanting. We can go deceive ourselves all we want, but that's not going to change anything one iota. Many profess the truth but are not sanctified through the truth. This day with God, page 315. Justice, honor, love and truth are the attributes of God's throne. They are the principles of His government which are to be established on the earth, made pure by the fires of His retributive justice. These are the jewels to be sought after and cherished for time and for eternity. In view of these things, build your character, not after the world standard, but for eternity. You remember the experience of Moses and Aaron. In Patriots and Prophets, page 426, it records about their failure just before they entered Canaan. It says here, with deep sorrow, Moses removed from Aaron the holy vestments and placed them upon Eliezer, who thus became his successor by divine appointment. For his sin at Kadesh, Aaron was denied the privilege of officiating as God's high priest in Canaan, of offering the first sacrifice in the goodly land and thus consecrating the inheritance of Israel. Moses was to continue to bear his burden in leading the people to the very borders of Canaan. He was to come to within sight of the promised land, but was not to enter it. Had these servants of God, when they stood before the rock at Kadesh, borne unmurmuringly the test there brought upon them, how different would have been their future. A wrong act can never be undone. It may be that the work of a lifetime will not recover what has been lost in a single moment of temptation or even thoughtlessness. How many times we say, oh, that was only one time long time ago. Yes, but one time, it says right here, sometimes one moment of thoughtlessness and temptation for the rest of our life we will have to carry it on and on and on. Is that what you want? Now is the time for you to seek the Lord. Now is the time for me to seek the Lord. We should be praying this prayer every day. The prayer recorded in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now is the time to pray to the Lord. Search me, O God. Try me. See what there is. Test me. We should pray for tests. We should pray for trials so that God can give us the grace and victory that we may be overcomers in the very end. And now is the time as we look at back at all these studies that we've had. Now is the time to make a decision. Now is the time for us to make a choice. Are we going to serve the Lord with all our heart? Are we going to walk in all the light that God has been revealing with, to us or are we not going to walk in that light? Now is a day of opportunity. Now is a day of salvation. Now is your choice. My question for you is, what choice are you going to make?